the, the goal for today is to give you some real world tools and patterns that you can take away and apply to your respective challenges and problems in high performance computing and high throughput sort of computing as well. Uh, so we, we want to focus more on the, the real world use cases and we'll demo some tools as well. No AWS Summit would be complete without a demo um, or presentation, so we, we're, we're going to do that as well. So let's dive in. Um, HPC is, is a common tool. It's, it's a very powerful tool. A lot of us have used this in our careers, uh, either in research or in industry. Uh, but I would argue that uh, it's starting to change. Uh, certainly in the cloud, there is an opportunity to do high throughput and to a degree high performance computing somewhat differently. So we have some tools that make HPC look and feel like they do today in traditional architectures. Uh, and then we also have some new approaches around scaling and even uh, removing the concept of servers and looking at serverless architectures. So let's think about the overarching workflow though. Um, any tool should support your workflow. Uh, and so I've represented here a canonical workflow that we might see a researcher or a data scientist or anyone working with data going through. Uh, so here we have um, collecting data. We have uh, events being generated. Perhaps we're running workflows and um, pipelines. We're integrating with other data sources. We're doing some uh, level of discovery and, and sharing that. And so we might be uh, maybe working in Earth observation and collecting data from satellites or from IoT sensors. Uh, we might be integrating with uh, events being generated out of S3, or maybe we're uh, generating it, um, events out of, out of code that we've written using our software development kits. And we have two kind of models of, of workflows that we commonly see. The first is, is batch driven. So this is where time is not um, a constraint. We typically see batch-driven workflows taking several hours or several days, or in some cases, several weeks to complete. And so what I've represented here is data landing in S3, um, spinning up tools to help us process the data. Uh, this is where HPC fits, right? So this is where HPC as a tool fits into, say, a batch analysis workflow. Again, writing uh, secondary data products back out to S3 and so on. So batch is a common workflow model. And we're also seeing real time as another workflow model uh, where we're trying to do analysis on a stream of data, perhaps, or we're doing sliding window, or we're doing analysis where we need sort of um, answers within seconds of asking a question. And we see Spark used commonly here. So we can run Spark on EMR, um, which is a managed to-do platform. It's trivial to do that. Maybe we're doing some processing in Lambda uh, for real-time uh, event-driven dra uh, data coming through, and so on and so on. And then maybe we're then sharing with a data warehouse. We're exploring with Jupyter Notebooks and so on. Right. So this is, this is a more holistic view of a workflow and a process we follow, and the tools that we choose must be flexible enough to support the different stages of that. And this is where we see HPC fitting in the cloud. Now, a cluster in the cloud is an ephemeral tool. Now, what do I mean by that? It's common to have data coming in and landing on S3 in AWS. Typically, customers persist data to S3 as quickly as possible because it's cost effective, it's secure, and it's durable, and it scales. So you land data in S3 quickly, and we can generate events. In fact, we can automate the creation of a cluster. Within 5, 10, 15 minutes, we can have a complete cluster automatically built and instantiated based off data landing in an S3 bucket. We connect to that using our normal uh, facilities, SSH, remote desktop. We pull data into the cluster, to the shared storage environment on the cluster, which is presenting the data over a POSIX compliant file system, NFS, to the, to the nodes, a typical architecture. We do our processing, we write the data back to S3, and then what do we do with the cluster? We don't need it. We shut it off. We terminate it, in fact. Okay? We're only using what we, what we need, uh, and we're only paying for what we use. And then we're then sharing the data products out. So this is a model that is somewhat new to people that are used to shared environments, long-lived clustered environments. Uh, in the cloud, we can do things somewhat differently. And we have flexibility in compute. Many of you are familiar with the families we offer. Uh, we have general compute, we have uh, you know, compute optimized instance types, memory optimized, I.O. We even have accelerator options now for GPU and FPGA. Um, and this lets you mix and match the right compute infrastructure for the workload that you need to run. Okay, so what this means is um, we can then choose instances within a family. So this is a, an R4 instance family, a memory optimized one. You see at the, the smaller end, we only have a couple of CPUs and 16 gigabytes of RAM. But at the, the top end, we're getting half a terabyte of RAM per node. And we can have as many of those nodes as we want. And we're also getting really good dedicated network throughput. We're getting 20 gigabits per second per node over Ethernet. 
So we're getting good high throughput capability to the node as well. And so if we take these things together, what it means is we can build fit-for-purpose clusters. So we're not dealing with heterogeneous clusters. We're not stuck on a particular version of an architecture. If we want GPUs to do deep learning models, to train models um, with, with GPUs, we can do that. We choose the P2 instance family, and we get K80 GPUs. We train our models. We write those trained models back to S3 and persist them and shut the cluster down. Or maybe we're doing climate science research. Maybe we're doing weather modeling. And we know that we can accelerate our code with maybe a new architecture like Skylake from uh, the, the latest uh, Intel architecture. Okay. So we've got an instance type called C5 that we've pre-announced, which will support Skylake. And we can choose to spin that up and take advantage of you know, vector extensions on the new architecture and do interesting work that way. And we can benchmark and understand what our workloads require, and we can pick the right capability for our workload. And that's critical. A little bit on our accelerator options. I mentioned P2. Uh, they're available in Sydney. They're an NVIDIA K80 GPU part. At the top end, we're giving you 16 of these per node. Right, so that's eight K80 cards in a single node. Excellent connectivity for high bandwidth uh, interconnects between the GPUs. Uh, so if we're doing multi-GPU on a node, we can, we can, we've got great bandwidth. And we're seeing, uh, seeing, we're seeing people use, use this for deep learning. Um, we're seeing it uh, used for financial simulations, uh, a whole manner of uh, different workloads. The one that's a little bit more esoteric and interesting is the FPG-enabled instance type. So these are Xilinx parts, FPGA parts, uh, that we um, enable on an instance. We give you lots of x86 Xeon cores as well, uh, but you have these FPGA parts. And you can have up to eight of these on a node. Again, excellent interconnects between them. Uh, and uh, you can still write your FPGA code in a high-level language like Verilog or VHDL. You can deploy that using a hardware development kit and software development kit we ship to the FPGA part, and you can flash that or write that, rather, to the FPGA in a few seconds. Uh, and so we have customers accelerating genome pipelines this way. Etico is a partner of ours that is uh, accelerating the uh, genomic analysis they're doing with FPGA parts. Or we're seeing people use, uh, use this for uh, real-time video search and things like that. The other concept I wanted to bring up is elasticity. A lot of you have heard, heard us talk about this, uh, and in the, concept, in, in, sorry, in the context of HPC, this, this matters. So what we can do is start with a small cluster. Here I've represented a, a cluster that's doing one unit of work for a unit of cost. Okay? And maybe I want to scale that in terms of space. I want to, uh, maybe I want to uh, uh, address more, more uh, data. Maybe I want to try a more complex algorithm. And I can scale a cluster and add nodes. Okay? And then when I don't need that capacity anymore, guess what? I can scale that down to nothing. Okay, I've got a login node with shared storage and no compute nodes. And I can do that in an automated way, and we'll demo that later. So this is scaling in terms of space. Okay, I can think about it in terms of time. I can, I can think about accelerating my processing using the same size cluster. I can do a, a, a unit of work over a period of time. But if my software scales appropriately, then I can increase the cluster size do the same amount of work or even more work in a shorter period of time. I can arrive at results faster. Okay, and this is a really good use case for the cloud. We have tons of customers from high energy physics to astrophysics to genomics, you name it, in lots of research domains using the cloud to accelerate and, and shorten the time to a result. Uh, and, and of course, that doesn't make sense in the case of an empty cluster. But you get the idea. You have different opportunities to optimize for different things, space or time. Now, no uh, discussion about high throughput would be complete without talking about data. And I guess more, even more importantly than that, how consumers access data on the cloud. So I've been really cheeky here, and I've taken something like the Newtonian uh, model for, for gravity. And uh, because we've all heard this term, right, that data has gravity, right? So I thought, well, let's see if that's true. Well, let's just be cheeky and, and put it in here. So the value of data is proportional to a couple of things. It's, it's proportional to how big the data is maybe in relation to other large data sets. And maybe it's not inversely square or proportional to accessibility, but there is some concept of, depending on how hard it is to get the data, the value, the pragmatic value of that data is, is, is um, proportional. So if I have to wait three weeks to order some data and send a hard disk to a basement and get that loaded and, and return to me, and that's my iteration cycle to be able to get new data sets, then the pragmatic value of working with that data is is maybe lessened. And so they're the things we need to think about. And in Amazon, it's really common to build architectures where everyone consumes S3. So we've talked about landing data on S3 quickly. We have different consumers here. 
On the right, we have um, Spark and Tez and Pig and a whole bunch of the, the Hadoop ecosystem tools sitting on EMR, and they, they natively integrate with S3 beautifully. EMR has been designed to, in a very high-throughput performant way, talk to S S3 as the shared file system instead of HDFS. Uh, but then we also have the opportunity to do POSIX file systems on top of S3. Intel has Lustre in the marketplace. BGFS is available in the marketplace. These are common you know, scale-out clustered file systems that are POSIX compliant. And EFS is a, is a managed uh, NFS v4 service. And then we have consumers sitting on top, clusters, interrogating that data in POSIX compliant file systems. So this is about as complicated as I'd recommend your storage architecture get. Okay, so here I've taken um, something like BGFS, which has the concept of metadata nodes that do name lookup and storage nodes that store data and have access to performant block storage, maybe SSD storage. Uh, and we have a management node in a different subnet. And what we've got here is an S3 endpoint that can pull data in a lifecycle into the POSIX compliant file system as a long-lived cache, which might be a long-lived cache for several weeks while we're doing work. So we have other clusters that are talking against this scale-out clustered file system on the cloud, uh, and we get POSIX compliant as the interface if that's what we need. So there are ways of doing this in a performant way, um, and this is one of the models. This is about as complicated as I'd, I'd say it would get. Let's talk about some tools. We have on the left some high performance computing products, on the right some high throughput products. So CFN Cluster is something that we built and manage. It's open source. You can download it out of GitHub. Uh, we have a Python command line wrapper that makes it easy to use. Uh, and we won't talk about that too much. Flight is something we'll demonstrate in a second. Flight is a product from a partner in, in the UK, from Alsys, uh, and it gives you a, a very traditional architecture with, with lots of software at your fingertips. Um, batch is a managed um, a cluster that lets you deploy containers or Docker containers that wrap up your software and run very sort of embarrassingly parallel type workloads. Maybe not tightly coupled MPI type workloads, but things that can scale across nodes. And EMR we've, we've discussed. Um, so the cool thing about Flight, and we'll show you this, is that it gives you over a thousand commonly used scientific computing applications at your fingertips. And the really nice thing that it's doing now is giving you Docker through Singularity, and it's updated the default scheduler to be Sloan. So what I wanted to do was, I guess, finish with some future thoughts where we think some ap applications for high throughput are going in the cloud, and how AWS enables some new approaches. So I'm not going to talk about physical servers. We've all been doing this for a very long time. Uh, I'm not going to talk about virtualization either. A lot of you are doing virtualization. A lot of you are not doing virtualization. You're running HPC on bare metal for performance reasons. Um, but uh, what I will talk about is containerization. That's been around for a very long time too. But there's, I guess, uh, an improvement in terms of usability uh, around tools like Docker, making it a little bit easier to package up containers, making them a little bit more portable, and then sharing those. Uh, and so we demonstrated that on a traditional HPC like cluster in the cloud using Alsys Flight. Um, it has some nice features about scaling, which is harder to do in physical world. But where it gets much more interesting is where you evolve past containers, and you look at something like a serverless approach to doing this stuff. So serverless usually raises a few eyebrows, because obviously there are servers somewhere. You know, we're running servers to do some processing. But what we're trying to, I guess, uh, talk about with serverless is we're raising the abstraction level away from physical, away from virtualization layer, away from containers, even away from the operating system. Okay, we're not even thinking about patching and securing an operating system. What we're doing in a serverless architecture is writing software to solve a problem in our domain. Okay, and the software is in a language like Python or, or Java, a JVM-based language like Scala or even Java and so on. Uh, and what we're doing is writing code with inputs and outputs and side effects, registering that with AWS Lambda, as a service, and then running that in an event-driven way, on a schedule, or ad hoc. Uh, so HPC on Lambda, or high throughput on Lambda, does it even make sense? Well, actually, we have a customer in Australia already doing this. The CSIRO, the eHealth team specifically, have already built a platform that is completely serverless that replaces a traditional HPC architecture. It's called GT Scan 2, and Dennis Bauer from CSRO just presented on that prior to my talk here. It was a fantastic presentation, um, so get the slides if you didn't see it. But what they've done is they've taken a, a big search algorithm, or a big search problem, um, and they've implemented that on an architecture that I've shown in very small type, which has no servers in it. 
So there's a web portal, it's rich user interface, people can submit searches, it will go and talk to APIs that are hosted on the API gateway service from, from us. Uh, it will then go and store state in DynamoDB, it will retrieve ge uh, genomic data out of S3, and you get the picture here. There are no servers to patch, there are no single points of failure to think about, there are no bottlenecks in terms of scale, and the cost is really low, because when we're not doing any work, the cost is virtually zero, apart from the at rest cost for the storage. Uh, and so Dennis um, typically talks about this platform as having one massive advantage, and that is researcher accessibility. So giving researchers the tools they need, when they need them, at the scale they need them, right? rather than waiting for, for jobs in queues and sharing constrained environments. That's a really big one. Uh, we work with uh, Rise Lab out of UC Berkeley in, in the States. So Rise Lab is an organization that have, that, that's bootstrapped out of, out of UC Berkeley to focus on algorithms, predictive analytics, and machine learning in a secure environment. And one of the tangential bits of work out of that organization has been something called Pyren. So some of you are familiar with, with Condor as a workload manager uh, for high throughput. Certainly in high energy physics, it's quite commonly used. So Ren is a, a lightweight bird. It's a much smaller bird than Condor. And this is a Python library. So it's uh, a lightweight Python implementation of a workload manager. And what they let you do is take existing Python code and wrap a, a PyRen executor around that code. And then that executor just goes and marshals the jobs, the, the computation across a number of workers running on AWS Lambda. And it does it all transparently. And so here they've done some benchmarking. Uh, they're, they're running up to 3,000 of these um, different um, workers. And they're seeing some really nice throughput. S3 was giving them a peak of 80 gigabytes per second. Right? That's, eight, what's that, 800 gigabits per second. That's approaching a terabit throughput just running code across 3,000 workers on Lambda. That's pretty impressive. Uh, and the, the level of computation they got out of this solution, they saw a peak of, te of 40 teraflops, which is a very respectable number. Uh, and they're doing some synthetic benchmarks here to sort of look at peak throughput and um, peak uh, compute. So, um, so this is real, and customers are using, using this uh, already to do research. So before you go home, I want to, I guess, ask you to do two things. I'd like you to have a look at our research cloud program. So I've got a link here. If you go to awsamazon.com slash RCP for research cloud program, uh, register for that. It's free. You can do that in about two minutes. And then what you can download is something called the Researcher's Handbook. It's been called the Missing Manual for Research. Uh, and uh, it helps you get started. So it talks in a lot more detail about what we've discussed today. And it'll help you get started setting budget controls, um, creating accounts, um, understanding how you, know, you use the, the platform to never exceed your, your certain cost and, and even how to get started with HPC. So do that in two minutes. And while you're finishing your coffee, in the, in the remaining three minutes, um, launch Analysis Flight Cluster in your AWS account, which you will have created through the, the Research Cloud Handbook. Uh, and give this a go, because I think it's compelling. I think you'll be surprised at what you can get done and, um, and how quickly you can get, get that done. We've got lots more information. Uh, please come and talk to us after the event. I guess the thing that I would call out are the, the demos that Matthew has built for us kindly today and, and run through are, uh, are open source and are in GitHub. So you can go and, and try these things. Test us. Don't trust us. See that this stuff is actually real. Uh, and if you have any feedback, we'd love to talk to you.